financial literacy and investment is a massive missing link in British society. That is a huge part of why we're in the economic pickle we're in. Britain has shot itself in the foot through a series of dreadful regulations over the last 30 years, which has eviscerated our stock market. What you're saying is brilliant, is saying we all need to get behind our stock market and it's not an evil thing. British people are now half as wealthy as people in a whole bunch of other countries, right? And actually, if I try and put a finger on that, the anger that that's caused is it's like, well, it's the rich people's fault. We can't have 60% of people not understanding compounding and then having a view on capitalism. Look at when stock markets were invented and look at what humanity has achieved since then. Regulation, regulation, regulation. Is red tape to blame for Britain's financial malaise? Is it the lack of financial literacy in the UK population at large? Our guest today, author, investor, and founder of Plain English Finance, Andrew Craig, thinks it's both. In a very timely episode with our politicians talking about growth and budgets and black holes and raising tax to stimulate growth, we talk about how Britain shot itself in the foot through a series of dreadful regulations and why the awful state of the British economy is a function of the parlourless state of the British stock market, a formal pinnacle of our society that we've all got the hunt with, and how improving overall financial literacy could help that. Fascinating chat. Just don't expect Andrew to go for a pint with Gary Stevenson anytime soon. Check it out. Andrew joins us today for his new book, Our Future is Biotech, which we will be digging into today. Andrew, welcome to the podcast. Delighted to be here. Thank you very much. Marvellous. So, um, Andrew, what's what's keeping you up at night? What's going on with your world? So... I think the, the, the one of the, the this is partly my fault by virtue of being a sort of hair on fire crazy entrepreneur and trying to bite off more than I perhaps could chew. But it's actually not a challenge that's just for me. I think it's a challenge for um, for the UK financial services industry and by extension for UK society more broadly. And that is really aggressive red tape regulation admin. Um, and without exaggeration, so we're regulated by the FCA, um, and that's you know it's as it should be that if you're going to talk to people about financial advice and you're going to, um, you know, th th these are freighted with consequences. People are going to invest in, in certain investments and stuff. It's, it, it is as it should be. You should have to pass exams. You should have to jump certain hoops. But the level, the regulatory state straitjacket now, it, the things I have to do for the FCA, for HMRC, for Companies House, just to keep the lights on and be compliant it's more than a hundred things a year. It's probably a third of my day job. And if you're, you know, that in my considered opinion is highly problematic for kind of entrepreneurial vibrancy and vigor in, in the UK. And I think we could potentially do with stepping back a bit from just how onerous that is. Because, you know, I mean, obviously we'll come onto this, but one of my biggest contentions is that financial literacy and, and investment is, is a massive missing link in British society. I mean, like more than 90% of British adults don't have a stocks and shares ISA. And that tells you basically that more than 90% of British adults, you know, sentient, intelligent people who might have great educations and be otherwise very sensible individuals, 90% of British adults are not investing. And I think a big part of that you know, that, and the, the, that that is a huge part of why we're in the economic pickle we're in. And I wrote a piece about that yesterday because if people aren't investing, there's no capital for entrepreneurs. It's impossible to raise money. All our best companies go overseas. And that's been happening in spades in the last two or three decades. And a big part of this, I would lay at the door of regulation. So, you know, trying to, trying to build a company... In, in all sorts of different sectors is, is very hard. Trying to do it in finance is particularly hard because the regulatory burden is probably the highest it's ever been. And, I, you know, it should be regulated for all the reasons I said, but it, I just think it shouldn't be quite as aggressive and in-depth as it is. You're an author, though. When you say we, what's the company? So, yeah, so so what I'm doing slash trying to do is, so I, so my first book, Housewaring the World, is very much the big picture, like what is investment? What is the stock market? What's inflation? What are interest rates? in And the business called Plain English Finance. So trying to do that in plain English. My new book's called Our Future is Biotech, which is basically saying, you know, the last century has been about tech. That's cr created enormous wealth, m you know, household names like Apple and Google and whatever else. The next century is going to be about biotech. And we can probably come back to that later, but the, the, the sort of intractable structural reasons that is. But because I've got those two books, the first book enabled me to launch an investment fund. So we have a, a multi-asset fund, which is a very defensive kind of 
you know, evergreen sleep at night um, or seeks to be um, investment fund that people can put in their, put their pension or ISAs. Now that's low risk. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and definitionally it is the way the FCA defines things as naught to or one. So to you seven. wrote a book and as a result of that, people were interested exactly. or gave you a position of authority to say, hey, let's do a fund. Well, it was actually in there. It was, cra- it was sort of one of those crazy um, serendipitous things that just it, it, it happened literatively was that I realized that so many people were getting in touch going, look, I, you, I really love your book. Thanks so much. Uh, I'd l- can I just give you like 20 grand or, you know, c- how can I invest like in your book? And this is, I mean, this is sort of six, seven years ago now. Um, and it took a, it took a lot, it's very expensive. I had to raise money into my company. Um, and we launched that fund a few years ago. It, it's What's it called? It's called the, um, the VT Plain English Finance Global Multi-Asset Fund. So we have that and that's a, a defensive fund. And then um, the Our Future is Biotech, we, the, my company, the directors of my company, have seeded a small private company that's that's basically an investment company to invest in biotech okay. because we are such huge believers in the thesis and specifically ex-US smaller company biotech because basically outside, the United States is quite good at funding um, all these magnificent you know scientific progress. And then we all know this because we know that seven of the biggest companies in the world and in history are tech companies and you know, Uber lost $32 billion over nearly 10 years before it made a profit and only America can fund that sort of craziness. Um, and biotech, you know, trying to cure cancer and spending billions of dollars on R&D to try and get therapeutic drugs approved is a similarly expensive, long, long form thing. But that doesn't change the fact that look, basically outside the United States, whether it's Britain or Australia or, you know, many of the European countries, We've got, I mean, Britain in particular has phenomenal science, right? You know, Cambridge University has produced more Nobel Prizes in physiology and medicine than most countries in the world. Mm. Um, and yet, The golden triangle. We have not built, um, and this has become particularly pronounced in recent years, um, the sort of multi-billion pound British life sciences companies we should be building. I'm. It's actually quite aligned with my overall, you know, my, my mission is, Nobody in Britain invests. Nobody thinks about investment. Most politicians don't think about investment. It's not even discussed in the media. You know, it wasn't an electoral. The, the, the London stock market had 3,250 companies on it in 2007. Today, it's got fewer than 1,800. The L- London shares were 10% of global shares a generation ago. Today, they're 3%. Britain has shot itself in the foot through a series of dreadful regulations over the last 30 years, which has eviscerated our stock market. It's not talked about. It wasn't an electoral issue. I didn't hear it discussed on the Today program once mm. this year. I'm hugely mission driven about trying to change that because, you know, if 90% of people aren't investing, if our politicians don't understand it, if our elites aren't involved in it, the, by the way, the, the, you can, if you are well versed in economic history and how capital markets work, you can draw a fairly straight line to all of what I'm saying to the cost of living crisis. Because if you don't create wealth and you can't um, uh, contribute tax revenues to the exchequer and you've lost 1,500 companies that should be employing people, et cetera, et cetera, in the last 30 years, Funnily enough, you just got to invent thin money out of thin air, as Rishi Sunak did, uh, uh, now in Nile Grant, that COVID was a bit of a strange situation. And maybe had COVID not happened, he wouldn't have invented 400 billion quid or whatever it was out of thin air. But, but the, you know, the parlous state of the British economy is a function of the parlous state of our stock market. Very, very few people understand that. And so that's, if you like, the big picture bit and uh, uh, very much the focus of my first book our future is biotech is specifically that as applied to life sciences, because we should, you know, our competitive advantage in biotech is phenomenal given the quality of our science. And, you know, we, we Britain has been involved with some of the most important progress in biotechnology in biotech science for the last, you know, many decades, but all the value accrues to America. And candidly, that just pisses me off because it's, mm. it's, it's a huge case of us just shooting ourselves in the foot, largely because of, very, very poor policy choices and, and bad regulation. Let's try and pick pick, pick um, apart some of these issues you're raised, raising. Let's start with the regulation one. I mean, I agree with you that we need regulation. Mm. I also agree with you that then you set up a regulator and a regulator's, regulator's like, let's regulate. Yeah. Let's have more regulation. <laughs> That's their raison d'etre. And yeah. kind of the people... Often a regulator tries to behave a bit like, hey, we're a membership club, we're friendly. We're not, mm. we're a regulator. You know, I mean, you get that with the Institute of Accountants who's sort of like, hey, we're your friend, you're our regulator. Yeah. Let's just be honest what you are. Yeah. What, you know, I think you could take lots of examples. I always think, you know, back a hundred years ago when children and losing their arms in looms or whatever was going on, it's like, yeah, we need health and yeah, safety. Yeah, yeah, quite. You know, let's stop that. Yeah. But 
I don't know how you stop a regulator from over-regulating. It's almost, there needs to be a sort of practical level at which you go, because they have to evolve because the yeah, world yeah, changes. Look, it's, it's a thoroughly challenging and intractable and thorny issue. But look, whatever we've done in Britain, so here's, here's, here's what I, I wrote a piece yesterday that basically said, you know, what is causing Britain's current malaise. And I, and I wrote a piece about what is hiding in plain sight. And it was this point about the destruction, the slow motion car crash of the London Stock Exchange over the last 30 years. And there's, I posted a chart which basically shows that, so uh, Australian shares as a percentage of the value of global shares, about one and a half percent of global shares, but Australian pension funds have nearly 40% of their billions of Aussie dollars in Australian shares. So one and a half percent of global shares, 40% of their pension fund. American shares are about 47% of global shares, and there's 63 and a half percent of um, American pension assets are in uh, um American shares, and it's the same. South Korea, it's the same. Japan, it's the same. Italy, it's the same. Most, you know, G20 countries, it's the same. They are massively overweight their own um, domestic equity market. Britain is 40% underweight. And that has all happened as a result. Meaning meaning that, so we're like 3.5% of global shares, and only, only, well, it's the numbers are more like 4%, Britain's 4% of the global market cap, and it's only like 2 and a bit percent of um, our pensions uh, you know, multi-billion pounds of your pension money is invested in British equities, right? And we're the only country behaving like this. And then we're surprised Why? that over... And, oh, well, and, and so so my in the series of emails and p- videos I'm shooting about this in the next few months, I'm going to go down the rabbit hole on this, right? Because it's been death by a thousand cuts over 30 years. And lots of people want to, you know, anti-Brexit, rem- Remain folk want to lay it at the door of Brexit, right? And Brexit was certainly one of the steps on the road to make British shares half the valuation of what shares in the rest of the world are. And by the way, you know, what I'm really always really careful of is sounding like some really dull city person, like, no oh, shares and valuation. So what people have got to understand is absolutely front and center affecting their lives. Mm. The fact that Brit- it's a f- same in a fact that British shares are now trading on half the valuation multiple of shares in the rest of the world, right? Yeah. And people are only and, buying them because they're like, oh, they're really good value. They're really cheap. But but, but what very few people understand, because they have no technical understanding of like equities and how shares are used for M&A and all this sort of stuff that you only really understand if you've worked at the cold face of like an investment bank or a broker or whatever else. And by the way, in my experience, vanishingly few politicians understand this, like listening to them and the fact that it's not even an issue. But if British shares are trading on half the multiple of EG American shares and British companies want to go and raise hundreds of millions of dollars to cure cancer or build a factory or whatever else they might do in the real economy, in the real world, or employ people, it costs them twice as much in terms of dilution as it costs an American company right. or, or a Dutch company or a Singaporean-based company or an Australian company, which is where we're at now. And this is all, so you asked the question why. You know, these are all, like 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 every big problem in life, these are all massively multifactorial things, right? Mm. And you can't just, say, so as I say, I think people say, it's Brexit. I mean, that's just so naive and Or even it's right? regulation. But it, but it, yeah, but it, it's it is regulation and policy over thirty years, and right. so and so the so Brown Gordon Brown and Tony Blair changed the way that um, dividends were taxed was the sort of first you know chink in the armor going back to the mid nineties or late nineties. Since then, there have been all sorts of things, some of which has been driven by politicians. There used to be slightly better relief on dividends. Also, but they, and, and, and this is the thing, you know, every budget, there's a new... Like, give us stability, give us yeah. clarity. Don't mess about. Can I swear so, on this the, podcast? You like, can. Don't piss about, you know. Like, That's and, not and, swearing. And, okay. But there, there's big well, changes. There's, there's there's we'll big, do worse ones than <laughs> on. Right? There's big changes coming. Yeah, Dude. well, we, who knows what happens in, October, in the next budget. But, but, you know, this is the point, And everybody's kind of second-guessing, as are... You know, as are billions and billions of dollars, euros, Swiss francs, whatever, of, of overseas money looking at the UK. So, as you said, the UK is really cheap. Isn't that really interesting? There are 37, I think, hang on, it's either 19 or 37. It'll be one of those two numbers. Uh, I think it's 37. There are 37 FTSE 250 companies currently being bid for, right? And so we're basically, hemor- so because of a series of bad policy decisions and bad regulate. So the regulatory... But hang on, hang on. The regulation in this country is the same as Europe. 
We have Mifid. Wait, yeah, although, we have although, all this we, shit although coming. Yeah, that's right. Mifid is one. Of, Mifid 2 and RDR are the two. And and uh, people, you know, I don't know a lot about Mifid 2, but, you know, it was a lot about, you know, fairness and stuff. And we can't have the old the old city but the way it works, it, yeah. you know, insider trading, you know. Ge- apparently you can insider trade in like a Switzerland. G- Germany, Germany, they only made it illegal in Germany in 96. And in yeah. Switzerland, you I'm, can still do it. I'm not sure that's right. Oh, but, someone uh, told me like this okay. week, you're allowed to basically speak to the CEO and say, oh, he says things are going to, X is going to happen. I'm going to buy some yeah, shares. Uh, I, but, but Mifid 2 came in to make things fair, which a lot of people would be like, yeah, good. You know, all these rich people making money because yeah. they're rich and they got rich but it, friends. But, it, but it's the law of unintended consequences, right? But it must be, effect- you said N- Netherlands and everything, they're fine. It must be affecting Europe as well, this regulation, isn't it? it, it yeah, it has done. And look, the, 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 the hair on fire markets have obviously been the US Singapore. and Singapore and Australia. Yeah, and whatever. Yeah. But actually Amsterdam and Paris have had a huge renaissance in, in recent years. And, uh, you know, I, I, I can't tell you why that is, um, why capital depth is better there. I think, but obviously Brexit did, Brexit at that point did have a disproportionate effect on yeah, the Yeah, a lot but, of capital move there. But, but we, but everybody in the city will tell you that we, what what the regulator likes to call gold plated. So actually Mifid 2 was ostensibly European regulation, but at every turn, Britain tried to show that they were going to regulate even more aggressively and even harder than the European legislation. And we actually drove... You know, and this is all fairly subjective and controversial stuff, but the the feeling from most sensible people in the city is that we actually drove the regulation ourselves to kind of extremes. And if you look at things like, I mean, if you if you place a huge, costly, challenging regulatory burden on firms, what does that do? The law of unintended consequences, right? It's great for Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan and Deutsche Bank. And it's really, really, lawyers, really, really yeah. bad. But it's great for the, and the big, you know, and Ernst and Young. It's great for the really big players because they can wear it, and they've got five thousand compliance professionals. But for mid-sized companies, so there's been so in the IFA market, the, in, in independent financial advisors, there's been this massive wave of consolidation because all these small IFA firms, basically, I can't, you know, they just chucked in the towel. They're just like, I can't deal with all this regulatory form filling and all else. So they, so so, and as part of that. What also happened was it became incredibly difficult to decide to put money into anything that was deemed to be too risky, i.e. shares, right? And certainly smaller shares and imminent shares and shares of people trying to cure cancer and raise money for biotech, you know, or, or even software or whatever else. And so the, the, it got to the point where the regulation is so draconian that basically all pension funds are putting the lion's share of the money into bonds. And that's why uh, the British pension industry has gone. It was fifty percent in UK shares uh, thirty years ago. And now it's three or four percent. You know, as someone who spent twenty five years in financial services in the city, looking at this stuff and not written a couple of books about all of this stuff, and therefore done a fair bit of research, I genuinely believe this is one of all of this stuff is one of the key contributing factors to Britain's malaise. And just to unpack quickly what. What that is, you know, our GDP per capita has been at or around forty to forty-five thousand US dollars per annum for thirty years, and thirty years ago it was around level with an awful lot of other G20 countries. We're all about the same, and now we're immeasurably poorer than all of those countries. So, what is absolutely indisputably factually true is we're getting in, poorer in the, on, in the last 30 years america's shot the lights out singapore shot the lights out australia denmark like the number of countries that are now 70 80 90 100 ireland on purchasing power parity is like one hundred and twenty thousand dollars per head yeah, they've per done ca- an amazing job. i know and it's like i'm an irish passport holder that's great i love it when i go into dublin airport and go hello it's so nice to be back yeah but they love that but um, gosh, i shouldn't say that um but um you know that that's it, it, who would have predicted that 50 or 60? Why, my Northern why, Irish why, grandparents why, why would have the pen, I mean, you're saying it's going into bonds. Why isn't that? Okay, so we've got regulation. Europe's got regulation. S- is Singapore and America are more relaxed about regulation? Then you've got, why is the pension money not going into FTSE yeah, companies? It, it, so because um, of a regular, because of, sorry, mainly legislative change that basically drove, it was liability driven investment, liability matching, right? It was a big sort of philosophical change 20 to 30 years ago where they basically said oh we got to um you know it, it basically handcuffed british pension funds from taking risk and the people who drove that 
obviously haven't taken account of the fact that shares are risky, but they're not risky over the long run. <laughs> and then, like, that's the whole point of, you know... What was the theory then back then? They were, what, what, what was this the 90s or something? Uh, God yeah, knows. I, do you know what? That's, uh, it's, this is one of the things I want to get into the weeds of It's more. very interesting when you go back and listen to budget speeches. They tell you a lot and stuff. You listen to the sort of politics of the time. Of yeah. what the, you know, it's, it's the... It's the ERM the, and whatever. Yeah, it's the sentences in between. But what they, they said, oh, it's a bit risky, the yeah, stock market. Yeah, exactly. We need to, we need to um, basically, make, we, we made the regulations really hardcore in terms of investing in riskier assets, right? And so, and that's completely destroyed innovation, stifle growth. And the, and, the, and the bit that, again, if you don't have a sort of technical grounding in things like equity multiples and how businesses raise money and how businesses use shares to acquire other companies and this, that, and the other, you don't really have a grasp of, so or, or you don't understand just what a multiple effect that has. If you if you take one and a half trillion plus pounds out of supporting British companies to raise money to do th to huge do shares, impact. but the impact's so much more than the one and a half trillion pounds because because you've basically you've just ripped apart industries left right and centre and hollowed out industries and pe and people leave like so I, and I guess the reason I'm so passionate about this and feel it most acutely is because I've just spent ten years working in the biotech sector where it's just ridiculous like just how you know all of the so so uh, it's not a biotech company but you know arm holdings is listed in new york right it's the biggest company we've created don't talk to me about arm i can't i can't cope with it well you, you know? get too depressed or yeah it's too depressing yeah, correct. it so was like biggest... a crown jewel of britain and, 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 they, and then during brexit chat they were like oh isn't this brilliant you know even though brexit and we sold it for nothing so, i mean how the and it's done, the and, state the, didn't step in and say this is our literally our best tech company. But the state, the state should have allowed us to have a functioning, so that it shouldn't be about state intervention. It should be. I see, a, but you should be able to should, raise yeah, enough you, money you, here because the pension files yeah, piled correct, in. Britain, and everyone. Britain shouldn't have lost its capital depth, and you know, and it, it, it is honestly the most astonishing case of shooting ourselves in a foot. But 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 so there's arm that's obviously a big tech bellwether. But but you know, similarly hair raising of 14 British biotech companies to IPO on a stock market since 2018, 30, sorry, 12 of them have not done that in the UK. Wow. Because they just can't because, and the, and you know, it, so it's this And they'd whole, only do it out of national duty and they'd regret it. Probably. Yeah. And that's, and it, to my point about the 50% discount, actually in biotech, it's way worse than that. It's insane. I mean, honestly, in my considered opinion, there are, you know, if you've got a couple of phase two clinical assets and you're um, confronting breast or, you know, addressing a therapeutic thing like breast cancer or, or, you know, a big therapeutic market and you're listed on NASDAQ, you're probably worth a billion dollars, maybe $2 billion, depending on kind of what, how big the market is you're addressing and how far down through the clinic you are and how good the data is and whatever else. In the UK, nowadays, that same set of assets on on AIM, on the alternative investment market, the smallest bit of the London Stock Exchange, I'm not kidding when I say it's probably tens of millions that you'd be lucky to be valued at. Wow. And, and there, so actually it's a big part of my new book is how on earth, you know, that surely is an ARB opportunity that investors are looking for day in, day out, except there are some f fairly intractable prosaic reasons why th they why, don't. Why, why has London been re listed recently as the top financial center uh, of the because, world because yeah because we're still incredibly good at insurance right yeah and that, so, so that as you take the whole thing and but what i but you know it, it's to me and i look i'm an equities guy i've spent since the late 90s, that's your I've background been, I mean, is, it, is that how you exactly. got into it you, yeah. you were in the city where you yeah was I, I started at swiss bank in the late 90s basically you know i was it was a baptism of fire i was amazingly lucky but i was on the smaller company equity desk so i was on the team that floated like easyjet and lastminute.com and burberry and campari and i was like i remember lastminute.com yeah, it was yeah, like it's, the it's, last the last fandango before the bus yeah well there's know? another you know but this is the point i made in this piece yesterday so like so uber lost 30 billion dollars 32 and a half billion dollars from from 2000 from 1914 from 2014 until last year when it made its first profit you know british business people have you know we have this curmudgeonly national personality we're very good at saying well britain's just a bit crap at business. We have rubbish entrepreneurs and, you know. Well, I don't know if we're crap at talking about money. I don't but, think underneath it we think we have crap entrepreneurs. I think we probably think we have quite brilliant but, ones. But lastminute.com is a classic example. It's like, I know plenty of people say, well, it's just a rubbish business. But, you know, look, why well, can, you know, we've the Americans are right for them. But if, if lastminute.com had had the capital depth available to it that Uber's just had available to it, Maybe it would have made it through. Maybe it would have been much bigger. Maybe, you know, and, and it's just because and it's this chicken egg thing. This is the point I'm trying to make. It's like, 
if you have no capital depth and you have, we've had 37 consecutive months of outflows from UK active equities up to last month, right? It's basically just money is just disappearing away. Wow. There's no money to support the, I mean, and, and it's at least one and a half trillion pounds, right? Wow. That's gone away from what used to be invested in. Do you in think equities. the city has got this image from the 80s that it's part of this narrative in Britain that there's sort of this this hatred towards these rich people and it's all right for them. Well, so, this, this is really so that's unpleasant all, that's narrative. All, exactly, and that's all part of the cocktail as well, right? I mean, one of the things I always go back to is that stock markets, financial markets are not for rich people. It's just that, that gets correlation and causality the wrong way around. Yeah. Is that people who bother to learn about the stock market Get and rich. Just do it over 30 years become rich, particularly if they do it over generations. So if your grandparents did it and then your parents did it, you're more likely to be rich because that's just how compounding There's works. a guy who works as a, a car park attendant. There's a thing on Instagram now and he's got half a million dollars. And it's just like, well, how did you, how's that possible? And he's just like, well, I just put $20 in every, it, every month it's, for it, 30 years and now I have half a million dollars. Exactly. Basically. It's a battle I fight all the time against trolls online right is is you know the, oh snake oil it's like u.s equities have returned an average of more than 10 percent a year since 1923 now it's an average w with volatility but if you buy every month over many years and it's like it, it, all the trolls are like it's snake oil it's, it's like no the mathematics are just extraordinary about but the politics of envy the anger that's out there yeah. that we're not able to get sort of you know the city oh it's all right for the city and yeah. and they'll you know i mean i battle with it on a tax front oh well all these rich people got it all off offshore and they're not paying tax i'm like no they don't it's I know, really hard to do that. i know and, and, but, and it's a particular national personality of britain but it's okay let's say we all agree whether you're left or right or whatever you're that we all want the best possible outcome for the law. I'm a, you know, Benthamite, right? The best utilitarian, the best outcome for society is the best outcome for the largest number of people. Yeah, right? yeah. If you actually really understand economics and capital markets, you know that the best outcome is not taxing the arse out of rich people because then you destroy your wealth creating base. Mm. And that's what we're doing. So if you want like, you know, the conservatives, we've now had 30, 30 years of basically you know, there's not been any kind of libertarian small government. There's no electoral option no. for that. And if you want the, the clue, it's as we were just saying, British people are now half as wealthy as people in a whole bunch of other com countries, right? Over that time period. And actually, so it's not working, and actually right? if I try and put a finger on that, the anger that that's caused is, is it's like, well, it's the rich people's fault. Correct, but it's, they're, they're, it's just the rich are getting richer and they've got their assets offshore and they're did and da da da. And it's yeah. like, well, maybe we should look. I mean, I agree with you. I don't, you know, it's hard to tell the difference in some days between conservatives or, or Labour. But for years. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, I'm a centrist and a libertarian and I, I get lost. Like, do we want to start the conversation hating the rich or hating the poor? Or is like, is this where we're coming from? Well, in we this just, thing? If, you, if you want a better stand living for everyone and you don't want seven and a half million people waiting for an operation on the NHS, you need to create wealth. Now, let me just challenge this a little bit. So sure. when you're saying invest in stuff, it's generally the secondary markets. Because I, I mean, I noticed in your book, you were saying the money goes to the company. I mean, rarely. Uh, yeah, I get this pushback a lot. Yes, but it's the secondary market that means that a company is valued at a certain level. And so when they then raise primary, uh, okay. it's also so poorly understood. It's like, well, oh yeah, but it doesn't, you know, if I buy shares in such and such a company or somebody else, the company's not getting the money. That's just to clarify for people listening who don't understand the difference between primary and secondary, whereas primary is an IPO or if a company yeah. raises money, they actually, you know, they go the to- The money's going into the into company. the company, right? That's right. But the way that the stock market works is, so if there's loads of secondary demand for your shares, if people want to buy your company because they think it's a quality company, you're doing good things, you're reporting progress, your shares go up. And when your shares go up, you're on a higher valuation. It's then cheaper for you to raise money when you of need course, to raise money. Of course, because you've got to give less equity. Yeah, or and you I can get better terms on your debt or whatever. And so, so if British companies are valued at half of what American companies or Dutch companies or, you know, it's not half of all global markets, but a lot of, at the moment... There was a piece by Schroeder's literally the other day, British shares are now on 40 to 60% discount to shares in other markets. With if you're a CEO of a British company, you're screwed. Like yeah. you, 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 and this you is can't win, you can't win the fight. Yeah. And actually that it, when you, you gave some good examples like Uber and stuff, it's like, you know, why you have to go to America? It's like, well, the world is and especially the internet is a world of aggregation, isn't it? And there's tends to be one winner. It's like, you know, well, we were talking about only fans before yeah. you click record. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a winner, you know, and it's British. But um, that's a no one realizes it's exception. British. Yeah. yeah. But I mean the other bit is on the regulation. 
you know, the FCA's sandbox and the FCA's attitude mm. to fintechs, again, world renowned and respected and copied. So they're not getting all of regulation wrong, are they? No, look, and, I, and it, as I said earlier, it's a multifactorial thing. So actually, if it, it, just to unpack a few other things that yeah, are all please. in parallel, because okay, so it's regulation, it's liability driven investment, it's pension funds. Not, wait, wait, go it, slowly. Liability driven investment, so that, that, the risk, the risk like, problem. Yeah, we don't want to put stuff into equities to risk to people's bonds. pensions. Exactly. What the fuck? Crack uh, were they smoking yeah, I mean, that day? Actually, you know when, what? You, when everybody knows the fact, you say yes. If you were, if you went to any financial advisor and say, "I want to put money in and take it out in two years," well, don't put it into shares, man. Yeah. I want to put money in and take it out in twenty years. We'll put it into shares as a mate. nation as well, as a nation, right? And that's the point. It's over decades as a nation, and it, I, I, it, it's. Yeah, I was slightly self-conscious because I haven't yet diagnosed who did that. You know, and it, who who is responsible for that legislation? That's another. That's, that's so, so, but it's vicious circle because by what you're saying, I shouldn't invest in Britain. I should invest that, in American I equities. Had, I literally had this morning on LinkedIn somebody saying, "Oh, Andy's written this article about how challenged Britain is." So, you know, everybody should invest in US equities. It's like, no, no, no. We, we have to. That's not why I wrote the article. You know, we want please to support, do the opposite. Correct. And actually, it, we must be at or near. But if Nadir. unless everyone listens to you. The guy's yeah, right. Yeah, but look, at the end of the day, irrespective of what some Muppet who's written a couple of books says, that, you know, mean reversion in financial markets is a thing, mean right? reversion. So basically the rubber band, when, when if Britain's half, if British shares People are half- People start, will start buying. Correct. So big Ameri- and guess because, who's going to buy? American Because actually I've been meaning to buy, like Rolls Royce probably might be around a little while, you know, yeah. has some incredible technology. Well, if we start using small modular nuclear reactors, yes. But, um, well, if they win the contract, do they haven't won it yet? I, I, I'm not, I'm not. There's like four people in there or something. I'm not was, on top of the, of Rolls Royce as an equity story specifically, but just, but just, I wanted to just go back to, so, okay, we've already done that slightly to death, regulation, poor policy decision, whatever else, but what else has happened? So we've, I've also talked about 90% of British households don't invest. That is hugely problematic because in America, it's a different number, right? So, and that goes to our combustion, eat the rich, we hate the rich, you know, stock markets, that's all rich unfair. People. Yeah, it's, it's this it's, socialist narrative. Yeah. Correct. And Britain's particularly, you know, in a lot of other countries, there's this stakeholder, like I'm going to own shares and that's going to be a big part of my life and it's going to deliver for me. In Singapore, they do it unbelievably well. In Australia, they do it unbelievably well, right? In Even in Denmark nowadays, they're doing it fairly well. A lot of that's to do with Even one, in Denmark? One, no, but my point being is they're obviously... What do they know about bacon? Yeah, well, no, well, they've turned <laughs> the pig industry into the biggest diabetes and weight loss company in the world, right? I mean, Have they? yeah, pig farming. Dan- Denmark was basically a nation of pig farmers that's had the top performing stock market in the world, apart from Australia and America. But it's astonishing. From Nova Nordisk being a ten billion dollar company, it's now a four hundred and fifty billion dollar company, right? And, the, and a couple of others, but it's phenomenal. But what I wanted to just go so. The other thing which regulation has driven in the UK, which is part of this, is the inexorable rise of passive investing instead of active. And I'm not necessarily saying that passive... So passive is basically, it's a great thing, particularly for people who are just starting off in investment, don't really understand how shares work. But passive is like you own the FTSE 100. You own the whole market or, or preferably... You, you, buy, you buy a, a fund which, a fund which, which tracks, just mir- tracks the whole thing. All. Yeah. So So... Passive, I thought, is you don't trade. You're not a day trader. No, but okay. strictly passive is passive funds are, are ETFs, exchange traded okay. funds. Where So you just say, I want to buy American shares. You own an S&P 500 ETF that owns all 500 shares. Yeah, for you, right. Diversified for you. Yeah. Now that, that, that they're cheaper. And there's an intellectual argument that says 90% of active fund managers, i.e. fund managers who are picking stocks saying, today I will buy Rolls Royce. Tomorrow I will sell easier. Lose. Underperform, underperform the market and yeah. and a passive you know an active fund might cost you one percent of your money every year a passive fund will cost you 0.1 percent of your money every year right and there's been this huge driver mainly thanks to the very effective lobbying actions of people like vanguard and blackrock i.e the people who manufacture these products yeah um who've made it so that you know on both sides of the atlantic um a lot of you know a lot of the finance industry now sort of has to put people into passive or they have to have a very very good reason not to put them into passive and put them in the active and that's again cannibal i'm just trying to elucidate lots of the factors in parallel in this multifactorial problem of why britain's in the state it's in so if everything's going to active a huge amount of that will go into s&p 500 which is the top 500 companies in america and it's what's called market cap weighted. So it doesn't go equally into those 500 companies. Like, yeah, everything's going into passive. Sorry, you said active. Yeah, if, yeah, if, if everything's pa- going sorry, to passive. Yeah, yeah if yeah, it's yeah. going to passive. So if somebody's, you know, if if X billion pounds goes into American shares into passive funds, ETFs of the S&P 500, 30% of that money will go into the top seven companies. 
because they're market uh, cap weighted, right? They're market cap weighted, yeah. right? Yeah. So what? So what, this is this whole. Do you, do you remember the Big Short, the movie, the Big Short? Yeah, yeah. The, the Christian Bale played the crazy drumming yeah, guy, yeah, yeah. Michael Burry, right? Ski on or Scion Capital. He he thinks this is the next bubble. This is the next, you know, the next thing they're going to make a Big Short movie about is that there's been untold hundreds and hundreds of billions of pounds, dollars, euros going in the top and, ones and, that, and, and the top ones and get that's bigger why and bigger Nvidia's and bigger. three trillion and Apple's three trillion and Microsoft. It's a bit like publishing in music, to be honest. The top people but keep it, getting all the spare stuff. But yeah, but that that's kind of an inherent, you know, yeah, the, yeah. The, it's a different the reason. head long yeah. tail is inherent in content publishing, right? But it shouldn't necessarily be, it, there shouldn't be a structural technical driver of that in the stock market. Do you the think stock, it should go to equally or no, by no, a different I, way? I, I, I don't, it's, it's hard to say that you should mandate anything. It's just that we should be a bit more careful of this theme because it's one of the most important underlying themes of what's driving the performance of shares. And the crucial thing is if, if all money is indiscriminately going into passive, like hundreds of billions of pension you know, assets from all over the world are going into passive and into American passive. That's a self-fulfilling spiral. And that money is not going into innovative companies that aren't in the index because there are thousands. So if you're, if you're two scientists coming out of Oxford or Cambridge and you think you've got a shot at curing, you know, leukemia or whatever, and you go and try and raise some money on the London stock market, 20 plus 30 years ago, you had a decent shot of being able to do that. Actually, biotech's a bit of a different thing because it's so novel and it's coming on right now. But in the olden days, there was a big ecosystem of active fund managers who would decide whether or not to put people's money into these companies. That has basically just been ripped apart because so much money is going into passive. It's just unthinking. It just goes into the 500 biggest com and the seven biggest companies, as I was just saying, the, you know, it's the magnificent seven. So that's, that's hugely challenging. And the final one I just want to get to, because the next one is a hot potato people do love to go on about. And it's another problem, which is never talked about, is crypto. Mm. I'm sorry, when I say it's never talked about, what is never talked about is... It's now estimated that more British adults have investments in crypto than have a stocks and shares ISA. Right? I believe it. Yeah. And so, and nobody really knows what the what the monetary value of that is. Yeah, we've piled into that as Brits. We we've have been all over because it. Of this, it. Because of this hate the rich, because it's a sort of screw over the banks, invest yes, in crypto, screw yeah, over. But yeah, here's yeah. the problem, right? Here's the problem with crypto. Let's say we could agree that it's about 15 billion quid that British nationals are putting crypto. Because it's like... I can't remember the math, but it's like 1,500 quid times X million or three grand times yeah. X million, but whatever. The math roughly come out. It's, it's, nobody knows and it moves around a lot because crypto prices move around a lot, but let's just call it 15 billion quid. 15 billion quid in the context of the whole London stock market when you've got like AstraZeneca as a 200 billion quid company, Shell's a hundred and whatever billion quid company and so on. Doesn't sound like a big deal. But in the context of the bottom of the market where you've got super dry or easy jet or companies, you know, the smaller companies bit of the market, sorry, easy jet's a bit bigger now. I remember in the days when I floated it was a small company, but anyway, the point no, is there's some good brands down there that people are surprised are British, probably including super dry. Super dry has lost 97% of its value. What? It's gone from 500 million quid to the square root of nothing. Uh, largely, is partly commercially because they weren't doing Oh yeah, as they weren't job. doing as well, but, but they were smashing but, it but, for a while. Yeah, correct. But a huge part of the problem is capital debt, right? Is the problem of being a London, they're now not, not listed on the stock market. They've left the stock market because it's just such a disaster, right? But the, my broad point is 15 billion quid that's gone into crypto because everyone's like, oh, screw financial markets and those evil assholes in the city, et cetera, et cetera. What does an altcoin do for the world. It doesn't open a restaurant. It doesn't. It, does, it doesn't, doesn't do anything. It doesn't fund scientists researching fact, a cure for cancer. It just generally racks up, uh, you know, energy bills. You know, and if you win, it's a zero sum thing, right? Uh, by the way, Bitcoin pro possibly has some real utility, right? As a store of value, as an alternative yeah, to the fiat currency. I, I, I get all that. I'm, you know, fully bought into that. But, but, you know, crypto it's is not building value in this country. It's an, exactly. It's, not, it's not you put some money in and you're actually employing people. It's an unregulated Wild West where basically a whole bunch of people do pump and dump. You make a few people rich who are all living in Portugal on their laptop, whatever, and or in Bali or wherever else. But what the most important thing is that 15 billion quid, if that 15 billion quid had gone into AIM, the, 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 yeah, the I've, got, I've got clients that, in AIM. That, that's that, terrible liquidity. That, everybody's. AIM, AIM is hemorrhaging company. AIM has lost like a thousand companies in the last few years because these companies can't raise money. Meanwhile, people have put 15 billion quid into doggy coin or doge coin or however you put And it's yeah. like, why nobody is telling the story? I don't hear about it in the press. I don't hear politicians people, people talking about don't, it. People 
don't want to hear this narrative. I mean, my, no, exper my experience is they don't want to hear this narrative. People like the idea that you can get rich quick. So the biggest problem with all of this stuff to me, 60% of British adults don't understand compounding, right? Really? And if you don't understand compounding, so that's what, so basically- The wonder of the world is Einstein. Yeah, Einstein, Einstein exactly, rumoured to say. But yeah. like, if you don't understand compounding, you do not believe when some wanker like me says- Compounding will turn 200 quid a month invested over 30 years into more than a million quid. Yeah. If at, at well, stock I love market the example, rates of return, um, right? Tim, Tim, is it Tim Robbins or whatever? His example is if you, rather than buying an iPhone every time they release you, one you every year. But you'd be a multi- yeah, it's, yeah, No, yeah, the yeah, number's yeah, insane. Yeah, yeah. It's like a hundred million or something you'd it's, have. Yeah, although I did see that post and I did a few back of the envelope calculations and it was wildly off. But, oh, was um, it? But no, but it is still- It's, it's still, still a crazy few, it's number still a crazy amount of money. But you don't need it like- if we were properly economically literate, everyone should. Because the other so, thing so people is say- is this back to education? Is this back to 100%. what? 100%. That's why, why I'm a business what, school, plain English finance. Yeah, why aren't we in school? I find these things bizarre, you know? I mean, uh, you know, there's, so, there's a few subjects. You could you could come up with a lot of subjects, but I think there's a few subjects that are fundamental to society. The point of education is so we can live in society and benefit mm. society. It's like- exactly. what health, be and, more health and fitness, relationships- Cash. Cash. Because you're right, because this, the, the nefarious thing, which left and right are always at each other's throat, right? and I think a huge missing part of that is how few people understand compounding and financial markets. And also the other point I get into about all of this is, um, so so I, I know a lot of people hate him. I happen to think he's quite, I think I happen to think if you read his stuff, he's not the person that people vilify him for, Jordan Peterson, right? Oh, and, yeah. and one of the oh, quotes- he's, he's really interesting. Correct. And he's, and he's But he's not the horrible sort of masochist. That no, he's, say just that, um, you know, he's just prepared to say things that aren't massively left wing. And if you don't, if, yeah, if you, what you say isn't left wing, people seem to get very angry but, with you. Exactly. But his, but one of his lovely points he makes is to, for your own mental health as a methodology to have better mental health is don't compare yourself to others today, compare yourself to yourself five, 10 years ago. And if you're constantly trying to be slightly better than you were five years ago or 10 years ago. And so I was saying this in the podcast the other day, like if I, I remember when I was 15, I was absolutely shitting myself about like, will I get a job? Will I get into university? How am I, you know? And if I, if I could go to my 15 year old self now in a time machine and say, this is what my life looks like, he'd be absolutely delighted. But I, age 49, looking at my life, I'm still chomping at the bit to do better and worrying about this. And if the, because I, so the point I'm trying to make here, sorry, I'm, I'm coming to the point. No, is, no, keep going. But basically like, if you do that, it's really good for your mental health as an individual, but society needs to do it as a whole, because here's my point. We're a real risk at the moment. Javier Millet, the Argentinian president, the new, you know, the right-wing libertarian um, Argentinian president just did a speech to the United Nations either this afternoon or yesterday about all of this. In 1800, almost everyone in the world was unbelievably grindingly poor. You know, life expectancy was in your 40s. Nobody had any teeth. There were open sewers. Everyone was, you know, on, on a farm. And no TV. And no TV and no sports teams and no beers in nightclubs and no, nothing. Mm. The world is unbelievably, infinitely better today than it was then yeah. and the whole of the rest of human history. And notwithstanding the current horrendous situations in Gaza and Israel and wherever else. And the challenges of climate change and so forth. But, but, it's, but it's capital formation and R&D and tech that's going to sort those out. That's a big part of my book, right, is... Bioremediate, bio, the biotech industry is best placed to solve all the biological problems that we face, one of which is environmental degradation and climate change, right? But if we don't fund any of these companies, then we're going to retard our ability to deal with those problems. But, but just to come back to this whole idea, it's like we spend far too little time as a species celebrating the unbelievable progress we've made and then trying to diagnose how and why we've made it. And I'll tell you how and why we've made it is because of the invention of capital markets yeah, front and center. And because most people aren't students of that without the whole idea of a joint stock company, which the Dutch and the British invented in like, yeah, they invented one bit. We yeah. Basically bit. we couldn't have done look around you, airplanes, buildings, you know, every and any, the fact boots walk into boots or, or Superdrug, or Waitrose, or Aldi, or Lidl, stop for a moment and look around. Like 99% of the stuff you're looking at didn't exist a century ago, and you wouldn't have, like, you know, cotton buds to clean your ears. I mean, the, the stuff, it sounds a bit ridiculous, but the stuff we take for granted is unbelievable. 
And if we actually dwelled on that a bit and said, crikey, isn't it, um, isn't it wonderful how far we've come? We wouldn't be trying to rip it all down right now because I, we'd realise... I find it strange how we like bad news or something. I find, I find it weird, our, our we're, psyche. We're, we're hardwired like that. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think our brains aren't necessarily our friends. I think, you know, it, it, there's a lot of what's going on here psychologically that people would break down into your, you know, your dinosaur brain and stuff. There's yeah. some, there's some stuff you can explain like that. This, it's like, you've got to be more aware of like the, 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 the shit ain't wired up right. You know, you've yeah. got to sort and, of- But then, to, but the antidote to that is to be a student of that, right? Because the more you read about, I mean, it's not, you know, terribly Californian personal development, right? But if you actually do take account of what all the top psychologists and psychiatrists have been writing and thinking about for the last 20, 30 years with fairly good science, like David Robson is a British writer, wrote this excellent book, The Expectation Effect. And it sounds all kind of wooey and like, oh, if you think your life's going to be great and you're really positive, it will be. But he's just, you know, the evidence yeah, yeah. now, the I Manifest it. Yeah. And it's, but, but, well, the Brits are terrible at this. And that's, but, which is why we're half as wealthy as the Americans, the Australians, the Singaporeans, oh, I, and God knows how the, you know, and Swiss. We I mean, need, I mean, my brother moved to America. He has a very crisp British accent, but he, is American now. So when he talks, it's very funny because yeah. he'll be like, he's super positive. Can I get a so soda? <laughs> well, it's with the British accent, but it's with yeah. the American mentality. Right, right, so right. it's like, you know, there's a lot of love in this room and you're like, what the fuck are you yeah, on about, Yeah, but does he live in a, he doesn't live in a flyover state, does no, he? No, he lives in Durango up a, up a mountain in Colorado. Right. But my point is more like the effect of America on the psyche is just on that positivity. You know, the Brits, we just love to be cynical yeah. and love to put... It kind of always been this way, and, I mean, I, and it's true. It's we, probably I mean, just the weather, right? We, we pretty much invented the stock market. We pretty much invented all these that's things. What's so so depressing. What, what's changed? Were we optimistic back there? Have we lost some well, of it's our? Well, that it's the old theory about you know the clogs to clogs. Um, like oh, I know that well. I'm a third generation. Right. Well, hopefully you're not going clogs. Clogs. Well, the fourth generation just joined, so we hope we've we've dodged I'm, it now. Fingers yeah, crossed. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but but well, well, congratulations. But but <laughs> but you know, it's the, the, the idea that. I can't remember that there's that generational cohort idea of like, you know, the, the people who fought the second world war had that horrendous traumatic experience. And then they raised a generation of kids in the baby boomer era who they were very loving to and, um, you know, permissive of, and then that engendered the sixties and free love and drugs and da 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 and counterculture. And then that everyone softens and doesn't focus as much on kind of, you know, I'm, I'm reaching slightly, but it's no, this, no, it's this no. idea Those, You can't a underestimate cycle. it. I mean, I always thought when I remember watching Mad Men about all the 60s executives in, you know, and they're all alcoholics and you suddenly yeah. see them talk about the war. They were all in the Second World War. Yeah. They're all suffering from deep, you know, they were 20 and now they're 40, 50 working in New York. As, With they, massive they, post-traumatic stress massive, disorder. And, yeah, they, and they drink a bottle of whiskey a day to medicate. I, I, you I know, genuinely... how those effects on society are massive. massive. It's so recent, the Second World exactly. War. And the scar of it you yeah. know i mean whether or not we, we think it's a you know a good or a bad thing but certainly you know that generation of which my father's one you know they come from a different mindset yeah. you know and determination and they value jobs and they and, value and, yeah, and that's, things. but also that's to my point about not taking things for granted which is a well-known psychological thing the hedonic hedonic adaptation which is that we we adjust to both good things and bad things and then take them for granted. So, you know, Viktor Frankl wrote that amazing book about being in Auschwitz, or was it Man's Search for Meaning, right? And talks about how in the... You, you get know, used to it. You, you get used you to got anything. The worst experience, probably probably must in the top half, uh, half a thousandth of a percent of humanity, worst experience ever in the whole history of mankind, what he went through. And he was able to get used to it in the same way that we're all used to air travel and iPhones and sports teams and mm -hmm. going to the pub with our mates and stuff that nobody got to do for the whole of the last yeah, thousand yeah. years of human history. Ever. Oh no, I completely with it. I get but, very irritated when people are, oh, society's just awful. It's the worst it's, it's like, ever it's been. Like, oh, and people actually fuck. say it's and the I'm worst like, it's hey, ever been. Give me your phone then. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, and I it's know. like, oh shit outside, you know? What, what about, I mean, we've done auto enrollment. We like Australia has mm. the incredible superannuation yeah, fund. Exactly. So it's all this pension money now. Surely there's an opportunity as society. Suddenly society's, you know, got companies to start saving pensions, which I think given the Australian model is not stupid. Yeah. If they, I don't know, I feel your frustration. Cause but I'm if just, it goes I'm all, just, if it all goes just into like, bonds. They just keep, put, I don't know whether the economists are to blame. I don't know. We've got Rachel Reeves. Let's see what she does on the 30th of October. But you just feel, well, someone with some sense, like, you know, like say, right, we're going to stick it but all we, in equities. But, but, but it's going to change society. Yeah, correct. We, I don't know how many billions are going in now. There's a lot of fucking money every year. It must be. But it's, my the, but it's a drop. It's like, you know, the, the various, for example, various small um, 
government agencies that are trying to fund biotech programs. It's like oh, it's small nothing. billions, right? When, you know, in the context of a two and a half trillion or whatever GDP per annum economy, it's we're like just, a drop but in the we're ocean. just not thinking, well, you know, I could take video, let's take biotech, but you know, there's an aspect of which we're just really bad at asking for money. If you look at what the video games industry have, some of the best video games developers in the world, yeah. but we're bad at asking for money. And, 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 and turning and, that into big companies. And turning, and I've stu I stood recently in Denver and we brought over a load of British biotech companies, life science companies, brilliant people. You Each of them you could see were brilliant scientists. They stood up in front of this room to very briefly say what they're doing. And they were like, well, you know, and um, well, you know, I mean, we are we are raising money, but you know, it's only, um, well, we're looking for uh, 5 million. And I kept, I was the host. So I kept going, what this guy's saying is he needs we're gonna 50. Cure cancer. By the way, what he's, he just told you he was doing sounded pretty bonkers. He yeah. looks super clever from Cambridge. I bet what they're doing <laughs> is mind blowing. He doesn't want five. He needs 50 million and we're British and we really struggle talking about money. So we it, there's actually a nice bit in that relationship with yeah. America. We need America. Yeah. But that when they say 5 million, you can imagine this room's like, I've pissed 5 million. I mean, but, I can't but, even get I know, interested. But, and, 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 and we, meanwhile, because, you know, as you said, we ex we invented all of this stuff along with the Dutch. So where the hell did and, it go wrong? Well, uh, I mean, it's something that's happened at some point, you know. Um, it's like, a, I don't know. Apparently, we used to be more arrogant as a country when we were very successful or something. But you look back at the history, the truth of it is, is we were the underdogs. And we love it when we're the underdog. Yeah. And France was the big powerhouse. And we were this little country. Oh, France is well, way on, you're, more, going, you're going back to medieval I'm going, times. No, 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 no. No, only a few hundred years. You know, you go back yeah. to sort of, you know, 300 years ago and stuff. And France was just so powerful and successful. Before, before the revolution. And we basically put together a bank and suddenly we, we, we were like, mm. let's have the best Navy. And we were just better at the yeah, Navy. We, yeah. we were faster, you know, and it was almost an underdog. We'll show you that no one took us seriously. Yeah. And, and I feel with Brits, if you look at sport and you look at everything, and I'm not knowledge about those subjects, but when our back is against the wall, like in the second world war, you see a different kind of Britain. Yeah, we're yeah, like, yeah. we'll fucking show you, don't you, you know, but the moment our, you know, the moment our pecker is up, as my history teacher used to say, the French are good when their pecker is up, you know, and the, and and the British, though, once we start winning, we don't know what to do. We sort of mess it yeah, all up. Fumble the ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very bizarre. Um, but I think, but I think the world. The, the thing is, though, it, it goes back to all of this stuff. It, it, the world is so global and so multifactorial, and uh, it's hard to kind of. You've got to do the sort of pastiche about British people are like this. I mean, like, what is a, there's such a wide range of. But the, but the set against that, I think the point. This point about our national, our curmudgeonly negative national personality, we could really do with giving that a kick. Because we, there's, you know, by rights, we should be world leading in several industries, and we, we've kind of given. But why that away. I'm with you? Like I have this theory about the press because I think the press has the power to not defy yeah. us, <clears throat> and I have a duty as a professional to, not to file dodgy, dodgy tax returns. You have a duty as a professional not to promote products at, like some idiot selling, you yeah. know, snake oil. Well, but by the way, if I'm promoting crypto, I'm not even subject to regulation. It's unbelievable. Competitive but disadvantage. For I would like are. the press to have a duty of care to bring us together, and actually, from the the thing you're saying, which I love is that and i get really upset with this myself is stop we ha and that part of that duty would not to divide us over tax and over money yeah and say listen you know the, the what you're saying is brilliant is saying we all need to get behind our stock market we need to like and it's not an evil thing Correct. you know i know this for these everyone's yuppies in yeah. the 80s and they made yeah. loads of money and that annoys people who don't have money but that you have to recognize in yourself is envy the politics Correct. of envy and you have to get over that and you can be on board with it you know bitcoin is driven by envy a lot of these things is driven by oh well, I, well they've got to, my mate made all this money and it was easy for them it's like think longer term think more openly and positively and just start being part of this thing and don't be afraid well, of it. But, but like very simply, right? I guess I, what I'd like to just put back on the table is w look at when stock markets were invented and look at what humanity has achieved since then. We had yeah. like 2000 years of no progress at all, really, like the dark ages and, but you know, with, with the Romans who were a high point and then that all fell away, who knows why, but the, the key, in, we had an agricultural revolution, an industrial revolution, and a financial re re revolution, and we allowed, which allowed humanity to to share risk and pool capital. That's what the stock market was, front and center. Nobody could afford to send fleets to the new world to go and explore for spice or whatever else. No individual, not even royal families, couldn't do that. So they invented this thing where they gave you a load of pieces of paper and said, "If you give one percent of the money for this fleet of ships, genius, you can have." And that's all it is. And it and 
And it was it's, about it's, fu- it was about funding an army to, to kick the French's ass, which is always reassuring and, and also today. doing a lot of things that Britain should be very ashamed of, right? You know, yeah. slavery and whatever else. But 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 the, but the benefit, what it's bequeathed the world. The trouble is, is so few people have any detailed understanding of what capital markets are, what the stock market is, and what they've given us that they just have this past it to your point, yuppies and big telephones, and they have this pastiche idea of it and think it's nefarious and bad. It's not. It's what's given us every bloody good thing that we enjoy. Well, you know, well, you, you can answer the question whenever that. I watch a Boeing 747 take off or stand by a, 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 a skyscraper, I'm like, how the hell did we sort this out? If, if, I cannot if, believe humans did this. We're you useless. Actually, if you, every, every day when you wake up in the morning, every single thing you do, cleaning your teeth, you know, like having hot running water, flushing a toilet, like literally as you go through your day, think about the fact that you get to do that. And 200 years ago, and for the whole of the rest of human history up to that point, nobody did. It's remarkable. I think um, what you're saying is brilliant and on point. Um, I just, I just, I just really hope that you know. Good on you getting your books out and your message out. Yeah, read, read my books and then. Oh, well, uh, you'll I agree. Know. I, you know what's sad is the amount of pushback and bullshit that will be over it. Well, when you actually, know, I don't when actually to, I, you're you're expressing a national like, come on, guys. Correct. You know, girls, whatever. I don't let's mi- work together. I don't mind pushback. If people have actually read the detail, that because I think the other thing is we're in a sound short, bites. We're, we're in a short bites. form world. Yeah, like TikTok yeah. is this this horrible sewer of everyone shouting. It's like don't I, I've done all these podcasts where they put one minute on TikTok and then I get like trolled. But it's like you need to read. Sorry to say, but you need to read like a hundred thousand words yeah, yeah, here yeah. to really well, understand. Well, why are we sitting here? Because I believe in podcasts as being like long form. One, one, so do one, I. One of the only you know sanities out there. Yeah, yeah. And anyone, I mean, I laughed at you know when they start judging people on soundbites. Ah, oh, he's evil. It's like have you actually gone and listened to the whole conversation. Correct. Jordan Peterson suffers with this a lot. The point I was making you, you, yeah. you take easy to take quotes of him and be like, I just think it's this guy. It's like yeah. go and listen to his whole conversation. That guy is a very intelligent. Very curious, thoughtful, caring, thoughtful, caring. Exactly, but he's not a sheep, and he's not willing to be a sheep. Yeah, he, he's sitting there going, "I'm sorry, I'm going to say what I th- yeah. I think is yeah. logical." And actually, there's great bits of him dismantling people because he just shows how yeah, yeah. they're actually coming with this agenda, and they're but sort of pushing. He's a sort contextualizing of thing. where they're where they're already yeah, coming he, from. He's like, you know, you're attacking me, but you know, um, but, but just just quickly, so genuinely, in everything I do. The outcome I want is the best possible outcome for the largest number of people. Yeah. And that's what gets and, and missed. Don't, don't like, we all underneath it? Correct. If but it, it's like, don't we all underneath it in this country not want the British stock market to fail, well, no, which bigger, bigger, is but basically but I'm, but I'm, failing? But I'm talking about humanity. I know. Right? Like, no, no, absolutely. Picture, like, absolutely. And, and we, are, we are so, you know, the, the, the failure to understand capital markets, the failure to understand what they've given us, the failure to understand how wealth works, how it transmits, how technology has, you know, our best chance for sorting out environmental degradation is technology. But, yes. we, but if we're not investing in it and everyone's like, oh, you know, and we're leaving it to the government, we're never going to get there. But anyway, anyway, all of which is in my book, available in all good bookstores. And all our future stores. is biotech. Um, <laughs> no, uh, look, really you is, you know. speak, your passion is great. Your logic is brilliant. Um, it's sad that this voice and this conversation, I, I like you, I'm frustrated. I only read the FT, but I'm so frustrated with the stories that are not in the press. And yeah. uh, we just focus on some of this shit again and again. We just talk about the same oh, thing. Oh, like Angela Rain, Angela thing, Rain thing, there's property thing. affairs and Rwandan immigrants. Yeah. Oh, God, and we're, and we're not God. talking about the fact we've lost half of our stock market. Well, uh, to it's be like, honest, what? that, that I mean, was the moment for me with the conservatives that I was just like, when they said our flagship policy is flying people to Rwanda. <laughs> I'm like, look, whether you want to do that or you don't want to do that, that should be policy should number be, 55. Uh, uh, yeah. 455. Yeah, 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 exactly right. Like fucking way down the list. You've made a great point. They should be saying, we have a national crisis with our, uh, st- let's just take the stock exchange. We've lost exchange. one and a half trillion pounds, 1,500 companies. That's what they should be standing up and talking about. But I don't see anyone talking about it. I see the Conservatives being a party of... So their simple answer to this mm. nuanced and complicated conversation mm. uh, is, it's the immigrants' fault. Yeah. And actually, the immigrants are... Uh, there is nothing to... No maths I've seen suggests that they're anything other or, uh, other than overall a very positive influence on countries. You know, anyway. Yeah, well, again, it's if you had the capital, you wouldn't care. Yeah, exactly right. You'd, you, be able- you, you'd be like, we can take... You know, also people get so wound up on the immigrants. So I started to Google it and I was like... So how many immigrants does Britain take versus the rest of Europe? Because I said to me, with climate change, with all of these things, let's just say these people really are refugees. Just let's say they there's a lot of people who are trying to flee their 
countries, whether they're criminals or not, I don't care. Mm. They're, 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 they're running. So we have a, do, do we accept that we have some sort of duty in these countries to accept people mm. who are suffering conditions? And people would probably say, well, yeah, we've got some sort of duty towards that. And then we're so upset in Britain. There's about 60,000 refugees who came to Britain. The numbers in Germany, in France, in Italy, Italy they're yeah. 200,000, yeah, 300,000. Yeah. They're, they're, they're a factor of four or five times the size. And we're like, yeah, but you know, why aren't they staying in France? It's like, they are lots of them, way more than are staying here. Don't we, shouldn't we have more of a conversation to say there are some crises being driven, whether by climate change or war or conflict or whatever and that is creating refugees and we should sit around like grown-ups and say you know how can we share this burden you yeah. know how can we look, take on these people yeah. you know we don't have the grown-up conversation it's the soundbite let's make sure we've got your conclusions your yeah. conclusion is educational systems across uh, across the world need to change to focus on understanding the positive effect of capital markets and how everyone yeah. can be a part of that, yeah. whether they be rich or Correct. poor. If we can't have 60% of people not understanding compounding and then having a view on capitalism. What a great, wait, I love that sentence. I mean, that's a great sentence <laughs> because you. I, no, I get so frustrated too. Everyone's got an opinion on tax and they don't have like a freaking clue what they're talking about. If politicians don't understand, so here's a, here's a point. If you don't understand how the bond market works, and the minute I say that, 95% of people are just yeah, falling away. I'm not away. sure I could tell you where it was. So the government gets its money from taxation and the bond market, right? Which is the government issuing bonds selling globally. Selling pieces of paper and saying, if you give us a billion Britain dollars, will pay you we'll back. give you 5% a year on that billion, exactly. right? But the broad point is, if you don't understand the bond market, you don't understand how the government raises money, how can you possibly have a view on how the government should spend money? Yeah. And like, by the way, most politicians don't understand the bond market and most politicians don't understand. And this is, it's like, we live in a capitalistic society where like 0.1% of the population actually understands capitalism. But, but the other 99.9% .9 think that they can have a really strong opinion on all these things. Like, it's, I mean, seriously, it's like, if you don't understand compounding, you shouldn't, you, you don't understand capitalism. And, and and I mean now now I do really sound like a terrible well uh, do you know what city maybe the problem with Britain is we're not very good until there's a um a sort of national crisis when we really come yeah, together we, we and work must together. be getting, we must we, be out or near that now right yeah we well until we start acting like an island again otherwise we're like it's the government's fault it's their yeah. fault it's the richest fault you know there's these such sort of divisions but, but, but the Gary Stevenson's as a solution of just yeah. oh, rip the eyes out of the rich it's all the rich like I promise you. Because if you do a comparative study of the politics and the economics of different countries in the world, right, over the last hundred years, and look at the ones that are 70, 80, $100,000 per capita per annum, and the ones that are like They're good us, to the rich. Correct. And don't it's like, and the, and the, and the, and the, exce the exception that gets thrown at you all the time is Scandinavia, right? And it's like, I used to work for a Swedish investment bank. Oh, yeah, it's always so Scandinavia. It's like, so, oh, but in Scandinavia, no, 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 okay. There are a number of things you have to understand about Scandinavia. First, their resource endowment per capita is epic. Nor yeah, Norway yeah. has 100% of its electricity for free from water falling and down Iceland. mountains. Correct. And Sweden has zinc and copper. And black. And by the way, in the Second World War, if you're neutral, your capital formation and your per capita like, is... Why do you think the, the no Nobel, Alfred Nobel, all that money, all the wealthy Swedes, they have all these huge natural advantages. And actually, the counterfactual is... How much wealthier would Scandinavia be if it had behaved like Singapore and Switzerland in the, since the Second World War? Immeasurably wealthier, right? But, okay, number one, we need education. <laughs> number two, you can educate yourself. There are books available, yeah, yeah, apparently. In all good bookstores, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, biotech is clearly a passion for you over, you really believe that biotech is the place to invest it, for the it, future. It, it's, it's the biggest investment theme in the next century. It's going to sort out your health and mental health in a really tangible way. Like we only now, there's not really any more argument about nutrition. Should you be vegan or should you be paleo or carnivore? We'll actually give you the real answer because it's based on your genome, your virome and your bacteriome. And, all, and anybody who's like dogmatically vegan or dogmatically, uh, or you should eat loads of steak is just dogmatic. Well, and that's helpful because that's how I feel. It's like you, yeah. you feel a natural effect of like what you what well, you well, what well, you crave. There's or loads in there about why it's we're only now understand. There's only diagnostic tools in the last five to ten years where we now really understand this in a granular way, and that's going to accelerate exponentially. And we'll re you will really really know exactly what the right things to do for your health and mental health are in a way that we never have in history, right? And and so so it's basically the three things from the book tangibly are. Biggest investment theme of the next century, health and mental health, massively improve your health and mental health in a really prescriptive way. And then a sunnier disposition, because it's like, to my point, how rubbish the world was in 1800. You know what's going to happen? A hundred years from now, we're all going to be on $250,000 a year, or at least people in Singapore and Switzerland and Australia and America are. 
and they'll still they'll be more depressed than they are now, even though yeah. they've all got flying cars and you know whatever else. It's yeah, just crazy. Yeah. It's a donic adjustment. Well, that's been brilliant. I you mean, haven't asked me about tour, do- dog or bullshit. Or yeah, well, we'll, we'll do a few questions yeah, yeah. now. What a tour de force, Andrew. Uh, oh, thank you. Know, you. Yeah, you know, no, good for you. Like, go out, bang this drum as hard as you can and tell tell everyone. <laughs> um, I think we've done everything. Should we just do the uh, fart, the ending? Quick fire. So we're doing, we're doing some quick yeah, fire yeah, questions. I was looking forward to this. Like the- yeah, yeah, this is fun. A um, couple of quick questions. Get to know you a little bit better. Um, and Dee's queuing some music. Uh, you should know the answers. And we're off. What was your first job? Uh, Paperboy. Oh, nice. Yeah. Textbook. Very well paid Paperboy compared to my northern cousins, by the way. They're very jealous. Oh, wow. 15 what was your- quid a week. Oh, really? Yeah. 15 quid a week. 1980. 1986. Yeah. Oh, wow. What was your worst job? Uh, data entry. Everyone says that. So bad. Oh, and cold, also cold calling, trying to sell That's the other one space. everyone says. Well, it's pretty. Those are the worst. 12 hours of not being able to go to the toilet. And you have to put your hat, you know. Oh, really? Oh, Fav- favorite subject at school? A very tricky one. History, sport, music, lots, actually. Don't know. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, what's your special skill? Uh, right, doing accents, but also I sing and play the piano. Do you really? I play jazz piano and I used to be a classical tenor. No shit. Don't ask me to do anything. We're now. doing some rapping and singing after this. You must Excellent. have to hang do around. do a bit of um, Fresh you have Prince. Jazz piano. That's I fantastic. I love a bit of jazz piano, yeah. Fuck, that's the best, man. Yeah. Uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? Um, a film director who wrote his own scripts and also did the scores for his movies. Slightly ambitious. Have you ever done any of that? I've written a screenplay. Wow. One day it will be made. It took Blade Runner 18 years to get made into a film from when it was first written. So I'm about takes a while. 10 years into my screenplay project. So Yeah, so you're on yeah. the graph. Yeah. It's a true story, a historically true story. Um, what did your parents want you to be? I don't think... I think they just wanted me to be secure and healthy and happy. They, they didn't have... A strong. View. I think my dad actually wasn't very happy when I went into the city. <laughs> it's oh, really? like all oh, the bloody city, but um, that's, that's actually, given he's Northern Irish, that wasn't a very good impression of my yeah. dad. But and, and you're an expert in accents. You right, know. So I read you are. He was more like, why is my son going on the city there? I love a Northern Irish accent. It's <laughs> so one of my favourite. Um, it's something so earthy. Um, yeah. What? Uh, <laughs> well, I've lost my point. Uh, what? What's your go-to karaoke song as a tenor? So, um, over the years, well, obviously on the keys when I'm playing, uh, I mean, like Hotel California or One by U2 or oh. lo- loads of U2 or Eagles or Beatles or... Actually, Diffic- not difficult Beatles. songs. Beatles are not difficult. Not really, no. They're very simple songs. I, 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 Let it be. I wouldn't I mean, cue, cue it up. Simple. Let it be, you'll be all right. Office dogs, business or bullshit? Well, without wanting to mix my animal metaphors, mm. it's horses for courses, right? Because I think if you're a, if you're a owner, if you're a small firm with a nice office that isn't a massive skyscraper with security downstairs, you can have dogs, but it's probably quite hard to do that if you're in like the gherkin or, you know. Yeah, I don't think they allow you in the big, that's when it goes wrong for me occasionally. I take him a lot for well, meetings. Imagine, imagine the if you, city doesn't go well. Imagine if you let dogs into a building like the gherkin or the shard, How like, and there were like 400 dogs that wanted to come in every morning. That could be challenging, I'd imagine. Yeah. yeah. But in a cool, lofty, like your marvellous office here that's eminently um, sensible and achievable uh have you ever been fired strictly uh i signed a compromise agreement with my employer i believe technically i wasn't fired but yeah i've been at a firm where you resigned it didn't work yeah by mutual agreement which was mainly them not wanting me around anymore i had to go yeah um what's your vice wine wine okay very good uh you've done brilliantly there uh I guess any top tins, top tins, top, tins. Top, top, top tips for founders and entrepreneurs. Uh, so this whole idea of the compound effect is so powerful. You know, the cheesy Bill Gates quote about like most people overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years. Mm. And the fact, and then people like Alex Hormosio, I know he's very trendy and popular right now, but like, you know, it's the people who carry on for like, two or three years longer than when most people would have given up that finally see, you know, you know, Chris Williams podcast, modern wisdom, he's like naught to 25,000. And then a couple of years later, he's 250,000 and a couple of years later, he's two and a half million. Right. And it's mm. like at, at any point he talks a lot and as do, and anybody who's working in these sorts of areas talks about how there's so many times that 
if you'd given up at that point, it was only like a few months later that the kind of non-linear inflection point happened. Anyway, I'm talking my own book because that's what I hope happens with my business. The non-linear. So when it's not like this, it's suddenly yeah, you, you get suddenly, these jumps. Something unbelievably serendipitous something happens. happens and it just yeah. mo- changes the basis. I think that's the, the, the way that you, you know, if you like, what's that? There's a, this is very pretentious, but the Machiavellian, you know, Machiavellian, the prince, there's a quote about how fortune can be beaten and coerced to serve the, the, the will of man. You know, you can oh, you make your own luck. And um, I think the, the f- f- primary kind of way you do that is just by staying in the game for ages. Because, you know, it's that meeting that you had two years ago that finally crystallizes out in something really meaningful happening for your business. If you're not doing it anymore, you don't get that benefit. Well, it's the sense of time, how slowly, it, you know, it seems to move slowly. But when you think back, it's like, you know, my God, how, look, what, oh. a year? You meet up with a friend or you're like, I haven't seen you in two yeah, years. Yeah. And you're like, feels what? like yesterday. Yeah, you know, it's it's obviously clearly time is Although not- that's that thing that when you're 10, one year is 10% yes. of your yes. life. When you're 100, yes. it's 1% of your life. So yes, that definitely has really an effect. Plus it. it's a double effect. It's not just that. You remember what is new and what you experience. Yeah, recency bias. Yeah, so you're kind of like, it's like when you go on holiday, the first two days last two weeks yeah. and then and the next two weeks last half an hour yeah. you know and you're like this is brilliant we've got two weeks of this i can relax oh it's time to go home. and whatever happens on the last day is your memory of the holiday so That's if something so really rubbish happens on the last day you're like oh that was a terrible holiday but if something amazing happens on the last day it was a great holiday that's how our brains work grab a paddle andrew yeah. thank you for being such a tour de force it's been a, a pleasure oh, thank and, and thank you for having a point that i entirely agree with so sometimes i don't and it gets a bit more battle like <laughs> Um, well, that's good. Yeah, that's good. No, it's always encouraging. I, this is you know, awesome. it's, it's hard to find fault in what you're saying. You know, people grow up, get smart, stop being angry about the rich and the poor and whatever, and just start investing, you 100%. know, and apparently it, maybe it do it in the FTSE as well, you know. Well, that would be nice. That would be nice. Yeah. Go after the biotech companies in the UK. Not, not financial advice. Yeah, not. Yeah. this is not strictly Read financial the book advice. Um, so we're going to play a little game. I'm going to name some stuff. You've got a paddle yeah. when okay. you've got to answer. Where do I Hold, wave it? Yeah. Very okay, good media the training yeah. there. Okay, Say the word. Uh, Dee's queuing some music. Um, these are some normal business terms. Hopefully you've heard of them. And you can tell me what you think. Okay. Uh, all clear? Yep. We're off. Personal trainers. Business oh, or bullshit? Business. Yeah. Very important. Have you got one? Uh, I, you know, I can't afford one at the moment. I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, in, my, in the early stages of the trajectory of my business. But I, I have in the past and I will in the future. Chat GBT. Amazing business. Business? Yeah, fabulous. Are you using it on a daily I am, basis? And I just fear that they're going to run out of money. It's like some ridiculous thing that every time you put a search into ChatGPT, it like hoovers up, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, it's not obviously not quite, but they're just hemorrhaging oh, are they? money. And I don't know whether they're going to make it, to be honest. Well, so I know I that. know the um, crypto is struggling to find data space now because AI has taken up all the data storage space. You Wait know? till we have biological data storage that doesn't require power. Wow. That will change the basis. That will change the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Uh, CSR, regulation, well, well, not really regulation, corporate social responsibility. Sort of it is a little bit bullshit, is it? Have you got much experience with it? No, to be fair. I mean, it's a big sentence. I did Uh, just write a load of stuff about how ESG, like Erin Brockovich, you know. Oh, yeah, the famous film. I I can't remember if she was a lawyer or something. Yeah, but she was like corporate actors from the 90s. Society's been getting better. Society's been getting more tolerant. You know, like a generation ago, like X percentage of people disapproved of gay marriage. And now very few people do. Right, right, do you know what I mean? But like the, the people, we're just sort of getting warmer and notwithstanding the fact that we like to be angry on social media and stuff. And I just think that... We don't necessarily need, that's just happening all iteratively and organically, right? And we don't need sort of loads of people in a big infrastructure to enforce that. Yeah. So it's, is CSR a slightly different thing and I'm off of the tangent? Well, um, no, I mean, it's, it's a big topic. It's, it, there's a lot of greenwashing and nonsense at the moment. Yeah. You know, I think, I think you've got to split it down to its components. It's hard to know what to do about sustainability. It's hard to know, you know, what to do about the environment. The social aspects really complex because, you know, we, we were looking at some aspects of it here and, you know, you get into this stuff of sort of asking people whether or not they're uncomfortable in the situation. And well, mm. my simple example would be that I think I would be right in saying that sense of humor is quite an important British cultural, you know, if you had to yeah. make a list, it's disappearing down the yeah, list because we're all getting so sensitive. Looking but, over our shoulders. Yeah. But, you know, it was fundamental to how we were actually probably quite good at communicating a good business because we can talk about things 
in a way that don't upset other people because yeah. we know how to make a joke. You yeah. know how to bring it up without bringing it up almost. Yeah. And it, you know, but then if you get into that as a subject under sort of CSR and what would be the right thing to do, you can lose humor very well, quickly. Well, if it's a race, it's a race to the bottom where it's the- Not gonna the, offend anyone ever. Correct. Imposed by the most angry, militant, person. unhappy person, then it screws everyone else's life up. We're Which is what, a part of the reason I left um, large company employment, by the way. No, we're yeah, in a little battle with on. it here because it's so fundamental to our culture. But yeah. the more people in the room, the more careful you need to be, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Anyway, complex subject. What about venture capital? Oh, business. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a tough one, and but it, we need it, you know. Yeah, it's fundamental. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's try, uh, what do you want? Incubators? You like an incubator? Mm, not so much. Uh, although, you know, why, why Combinator? How good are they? And, yeah, pretty you know, cool. And, and they the changed the world. Uh, horses, they're horses, they're horses, American horses. one. They are, yeah. Why do you think Y Combinator is so good? I, I think it's kind of like, if, have you read that Nicholas Taleb Nassim book, uh, Fooled by Randomness? Mm. Which is basically like Warren Buffett. If you, if you toss a coin, 10,000 times it will land on the side there'll be one, one well no but there'll be one that was heads for 30 years in a row and post uh, you know post hoc or whatever you're looking backwards Warren Buffett's just the guy who's heads that if you because all the other 10,000 fund managers have fallen away ah. so, so, and it's a bit like that it's like why is any un, why is Sequoia Capital the one that is better than it's kind of like just because it is now, I'm not sure, by the way, I completely subscribe to that. I think there is skill um, in these things. That's an interesting and point. There's a great Darren Brown when he does that with horse racing. He picks the horse in every race and then he shows you how he did it. He had loads of people, you know, he did every horse and <laughs> they, it was just the one he won, you know. Do you remember that Alan? Do you ever watch Alan Partridge back in the day? I mean, did I watch Gypsy, Alan Partridge? Was, I watched the, all the, of it the, the, backwards. When he used to be doing the horse, he was like, Gypsy, Alf Ramsey, Gypsy Massacre. <laughs> Christ's chin. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, that's so no, but you're making me think of Derek and Clive. You've ever heard the Derek yes, and Clive horse? Like, Tits got a flyer. <laughs> it's first to show. <laughs> we can't go there. It's far too sweary. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> We've never checked out Derek and Clive's uh, go horse race. It. Go, go and listen yeah, yeah, to that. Yeah. It's a genius piece. And of Alan Partridge. Outrageous Alan, double uh, and, and also, actually, um, on the day today, there was this amazing character played by Dune McGeekin beautiful Scottish lady who um, was a brilliant comedian as well and it's called Collaterally Sisters and it's like the business news at the end of the day you remember the day today oh man and that's where but, Alan Partridge started yeah correct and it, Collaterally Sisters is other character Dean <laughs> Dune or Dean McGeekin this amazing comedian and it's like this complete piss take of the city news how ridiculous it is and it's honestly it's the funniest thing you'll watch look it up on YouTube it may have dated slightly no it's, it's oh it's still Gen genuinely, I was, I'm just I was feeling like we're two 40 year old no, men loving it, it, Alan Partridge. No, well, there is you know, that. he's doing Doctor Strange Love. I need to go buy tickets. Alan Partridge, well, know. Steve Coogan, no, I it's on in that. London. Um, I think this is an obvious one. We'll have, to, we'll have to find something more spicy for you. Startup culture. Oh, good, good. Actually, well, well, give me the. Because I think ultimately, like, that's them. It like, must be business. Especially in this, I mean, you know, we're sort of a startup that's nearly 10 years old, um, but it's hard. And so I think people need support and they need they shouldn't be vilified, you know? I think our startup culture is okay here. It's the you, turning into 10 billion pound example companies. I about crypto. It's mm. so true how everyone's jumped on that bandwagon. Everyone's like, mm. I'm into crypto. Now they're all into AI. Yeah. Um, interesting one, universal basic income. Oh, now that Whoa. is. What so do you think, Andrew? I almost think it's inevitable. And I and and, and I. But the, so there's an inflation problem, which is really poorly understood. Is that so? So like, is this, okay? If you want to give everyone thirty grand a year next year, why not just give everyone three million a year? What do you mean? You got that's so, way you can so, afford so that. No, the point is that if you give it, right, if there's this much money in the economy and there's this much stuff. Crops, oil, wheat, steel, whatever, right? Then there's this much money. Money is one, stuff is one that mm. we've produced. If you double the money to two, it doesn't really make any more stuff get made because farmers have got to plant crops and, you know, scientists yeah, yeah. have got to research things and factories need to be built and oil refineries and whatever. So what happens? The price now is two because there's two X, the money's gone from one to two, but stuff is still one. So that's, that's inflation, right? Mm. UBI's biggest problem is if you just give out shit loads of money, and it doesn't engender more economic output, all you've done is create inflation, which is actually what we've been doing in the West for 50 years, right? Yeah. That's why everybody feels poorer, even though our, that's why a pint, in, I'm, I'm about to go and have my first pint for quite a long time, and that's gonna be six quid, 
And I remember when I was at university, it was one quid. And you know, people people sort of scoff at the if you'd said to people what house prices would be today, twenty years ago, that's no, how you know when house prices were like we're in the seventies when house prices were ten grand and yeah. the car was fifty quid or you know, and like but we have it's called money illusion. So the problem with UBI is the minute it, 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 if you if you print shitloads of money to create UBI, you have an inflation problem because if you don't have the economic output, but the counter problem to that is tech biotech like if we if we do create enough real wealth and if you know ai and robots and blah blah, blah are just doing all the crap jobs like and then we are going to need ubi because we won't need you know it's like well it's a bit like countries who have huge natural resources who can just slightly hand out money i, d- I like, don't know well, if like it's saudi, saudi arabia saudi norway arabia, norway but, exactly. but just because the other thing that's really fascinating like if you'd gone to somebody in 1800 and said when by the way 98 percent of human beings worked on the land in agriculture or 90s or whatever but it was 90 something percent the yeah, rest yeah. Were in mines and then some aristocrats floating around drinking port right but but if you but if you'd gone and said guys by 2024 less than one percent of people will work in agriculture on the land they'd be like we're fucked like what how is that even conceivable that like 95 percent of the population are going to find something else to do right and through the conceptual prism of you in 1800 in a field in Yorkshire you were like, That's it. but they didn't know about airline pilots or biotech entrepreneurs or influencers or food critics yeah isn't or, it the line anyone who assumes there's a limit to human creativity yeah, is an it, idiot but it's know? also lump of labour fallacy that there's this lump of labour yeah yeah it's, 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 it's infinite but that having been said I sort of wonder about whether that can happen again in the next century to the same extent but maybe it can because if it can't if it doesn't and we create all this wealth but we don't need people. I think to we'll do come jobs. up with stuff to do. I think I think busy people like you yeah. and stuff, we can't help ourselves. Yeah. But we might be doing whether anybody wants to pay us for it or not well, is the question. There's there. an infinite amount of stuff to do, you know. I mean yeah. apparently we've got to get to Mars and stuff. Yeah, no, that's all right. You know, yeah. we're busy. Yeah. Um insurance? Oh whoa. I mean, it's pretty we couldn't build a big ship or fly an aeroplane without it, right? Or make a movie. It sounds like, though, from what you're saying, that the British financial or London's financial position is sewed up by insurance markets. It's a big part. Which is giving everybody a full sense of comfort that everything's all right at London Well, as HQ. long as we keep being very good at insurance. It's something. But when our AI starts doing it, all well, London's screwed, isn't it? Equity's gone. Yeah. Will AI, AI will do, I mean, you're getting into the land of... Um, Who knows? I don't know much about insurance. Who knows? Who's got a nose? Who knows? Mm. Alternative investment market then. What do you think of it? Well, that's business. It should be. Yeah. Abs- it used to be good, uh, didn't it? Well, ish. It's never been quite what it was supposed to be. Yeah. But that's, we've, we've ripped it to shreds. I mean, it's just tragic. It's tragic. There's, it's so, it's so hard. I mean, I've had personal experience. Where I've worked for like 50 plus AIM companies in the last decade trying to raise money on AIM and it's just hellishly difficult you know companies that by rights if they were in the west coast in california with a rolodex of like mates working for big vcs they would have raised hundreds of millions of dollars and we'd have world we'd have a new machine that does a blood test for cancer in an hour that rather than a horrible prostate thing which fire spikes up your you know um you know with, with the things we could have done if we had a capital depth and we hadn't ripped apart our stock market and aim is really suffered but aim should let's hope aim so aim after the lot after that so aim has is down more than 40 percent in the last two years as a whole um and it was down 38 percent in the dot-com crash and like 28 percent thereabouts after the global financial crisis in 07 and in the two years following those two last crashes it was up like 110 percent both times or 130 percent so there we i think this one's gonna be a bit longer and stronger the 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 fall but i think aim i think on a three to five to seven year view we're going to look back and go that was pretty obvious aim was going to have a massive bounce okay. but but the budget i have clients the budget, in it and it's tough it's hard yeah um digital nomads what do you think about these well, these, I'm, these, I'm these gonna tax have dodgers to say, uh, business just because yeah. like cool well done you know yeah, if you want to yeah. go and live on a beach in bali and you can make that work hats off to you yeah do it esg investing is it Bullshit. There's my point. It, we don't need it. It's just it, it. It's just a label that the financial services industry is used to make more money, right? Mm. Because so I'm going to lose my voice, but <coughs> because we don't need it, because we're getting ESG organically. Yeah. So you. So really, your your point would be 
why why are we putting a label and focusing on certain and wasting vast amounts of resource and money and capital on <coughs> oh. can i trouble yeah, one of yeah. your colleagues for a glass of <laughs> I do this in every interview. It's like, it and then I lose my voice and start crying and very embarrassed. You need a uh, fisherman's friend or something. Or vo so, vocal zones. <clears throat> exactly. Tom Jones. Whatever, yeah, or just or a peppermint tea. <laughs> or a pint. None, none of those things are available. No, no, no hopefully there's water on its way. Uh, I'll give you a moment. I mean, we'll do a couple no, it's more. That's all right, it's all right. I can go. Uh, I'll just, my wife will just pull my leg about how I always dissolve into coughs and crying actually. <laughs> it's not very good and that's after sex <laughs> what, what, what's that exactly. sorry darling um, well, she, by the way she's gonna don't worry we can edit that <laughs> you know my wife I, went, I, I, t I told her last night I said to my wife I'm like I talk about you all the time I'm like Columbo I'm always bringing up my wife as this but, yeah, sort of same. imaginary well, she, character she said to me as I left today she's like don't talk about your personal life like you always do and I was like what do you mean I don't talk about you're always mentioning the children and it's like well it humanizes you, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I think I think I'm the same. I'm very well. I learned something about ladies, generally sexist. I don't mean to generalize, blah blah, but um, they're incredibly private about information. I think something to do with the way you know. When I grew up, I always had the same friends, and my sister was always changing her friends. They were right. falling out and things like this. If a lady ever tells you anything yeah. and then you try and say to this other person oh so and so they'll say i never said anything i they <laughs> deny everything and there's something about so they i've had stuff in this firm you know i work with so many women and then one of them will tell me something i'll try and talk to the other one and then they'll they'll say, I know, I'll, then they'll say oh did you no i never said any of that I never, and i'm like no but you did and they'll all go oh no i didn't and there's this like they never want to be like on record saying anything I think, I about think you're, anyone you're, you're on very shaky ground i am i'm not commenting on this okay very good <laughs> a ai created content excellent i mean business yeah because i'm gonna it. make my movie finally with that okay i won't need yeah it's gonna be amazing would you get it to write a book for you no i i would get it to help and then i'd uh because it well who knows where we'll be three years from now but wouldn't it be amazing to just because actually the things i have swimming in my head in terms of bullet points around the next books i'd love the books i'd love to write the projects i love the science fiction novel over whatever you know if I could just sit there and a shortcut getting that out of my head into a six well, you could take you book. could take the hour that you you spend explaining something and get AI to go in and fill in the gaps yeah, and look up the facts and right, put some pie right, charts and then, and then in. And just do an edit job at the end. That'd yeah. be amazing. Well, why not? Why have to do all the hard work? You yeah, know? The only problem with it though is, as if that means that supply supply has already exploded, right? Of content, whether it's two hundred million podcasters or whatever the number is, or how many more books published because Amazon self published Kindle, or whatever. Which means it's harder than ever to make money out of stuff like that, right? You know, if you're if you were a published author in early 1980s, you probably made a few quid. Now most books make nothing. Yeah, right. You have to be a proper, proper top of the tree bestseller to make any kind of money out of books. Yeah, it's the long tail. Yeah. Um, drinking at lunch. I mean, don't, don't let me down. With with with, I mean. Not more than two or three times a month. Yeah. But I, now I don't do that anymore because I'm an entrepreneur at home. But um, yeah. So you said you're having your first beer in a long time. You've given up drinking. I no, mean. I haven't given up drinking. I just had nearly a week off, which for me is quite good. Okay, um, okay. I'm just, on the same Just page. as a workload. But no, no, that's more the... Because I live out in the depths of Hampshire now and I've got a six-year-old and a four-year-old. I, when I come into London, I tend to just get the, the earliest train home I can and yeah, have yeah. dinner and go to bed. And I tend to get up, I get up at like 5 a.m., so that sounds like a, no, no, I'm it's fine. Five AM club. I'm you doing, got kids yeah, too. I, shower, I have like. a five, five and a four year old. It's it's. But uh, it's just so much easier not to be at. But so I just haven't had a beer. I haven't been met a mate and had a beer after work in London for a long time. So it's delicious. <laughs> okay, we'll <laughs> do a couple more. Uh, EBITDA. Well, earnings before index, interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. Well, it's. Well, I why explain I mean, why it's business. I don't get as an accountant, this thing pisses me off because I'm like we're missing half the no, cost. No, but what you mean is you mean adjusted EBITDA, surely? I, I, I don't know what I mean. Why are we taking out the capital cost of running a business? So, so you can so you can compare the underlying activity, operational like metrics gross gross it's, profit. It's, it's apples it. with apples, right? Right. Because companies, oh, look, of course, companies with different capital structures. But then you want to be able to look through that and say, okay, but netting out the capital structure, how, what's the operational multiple for that would be my I mean, that's view. helped me understand it, but I, you know, I, uh, 
yeah, I still struggle. You still think it's but, bullshit? Well, I'm an accountant, so it's just half the picture to me. Free cash flow is much more important, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. something like that. All right, we're going to do two more. Uh, we're going to do lawyers. Well, I'm sorry, but they're necessary. They're necessary. They are, I liked how you said that, even with a crisp. They're necessary. Well, one, of, one, of my fr- one of my good friends um, from many, many years ago uh, it is is one of the most successful lawyers of his age in London at the moment. And what is slightly annoying is that when we first met, I had no idea that there was a chance in his career that he could earn sort of as much as some of the highest paid hedge fund managers make. That's mm. how, I don't think they did 30 years ago. I mean, are we talking like, it's it's astonishing you can, what the top for, corporate lawyers make now. So. Yeah, you can. But you and need them, and I, I need them. I think it's surprising to learn that lawyers are so financially motivated too. That was surprising for me because they, they tend to sort of seem to be about something else, but actually they're well, quite financially there's motivated. There's a big difference between a civil rights barrister and a corporate true, solicitor. True, right? true, I mean, true. Yeah, horses for courses. Exactly. Bananas for coconuts. Yeah. Uh, or cocoa. Or, which cocoa. One was it? cocoa. Uh, actually, I might cheat. We might do two more, but decentralized autonomous organizations. Those. I don't think it's a bit of that. Actually. Yeah, a little bit of bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm they not are, cl- sure. Yeah, I'm not claiming to be a massive expert on them, but it's like... Well, you're trying, the... it's the alternative universe for me. As a tax person, it's a bit of a struggle. I, mean, I had a meeting with the society about, well, you know, we need someone who's understand how we're going to be taxed. It's like, we're well, going to be taxed where the people are, you know? And they're like, yeah, but you know, we're not anywhere. No, you're somewhere. That's the, this, you that, don't but, live on but, Mars. But the crypto visionaries are like, well, the, no state can, it's outside of the state because it's disaggregated and decentralized and it's in bytes and bits on computers all over the world. It's like, no, because if you, they make it illegal, like... If you cross borders mm. with cocaine and get caught, you get put in prison. Well, if you cross borders and you own Bitcoin and the American authorities have decided that it's a threat to the hege- hegemonic power of the US dollar and they make it illegal and you get caught, yeah, yeah. they have a monopoly of violence within their polity and it's like unlucky and it doesn't matter that it's decent. So that's I find that really obtuse that people can't sort of... And whilst nation states continue to have a monopoly of violence in their borders... If they decide to legislate, that's such an something. interesting says, statement. A monopoly of violence on their borders. That's what police and army are, right? That's what state. That's yeah. the Leviathan Hobbs. That's what a state right, is. Right. Ultimately, right. ultimately they control their borders. Of violence. Yeah. Wow. Well, and I like, you, I like the phrase. And we'll end on this, uh, which I feel might sum it up: the London Stock Exchange, the that's main market, business, and it needs to be ten x the business that it currently is. Thank you, Andrew. You've been absolutely brilliant, I have to <laughs> say. Um, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, Me I too. Assume... I'll, c- I'll come back. Oh, please. Anytime. Oh, man. Yeah. And come come with the piano. Um, Top banana. So people can find you anywhere and anywhere, I imagine. Andrew Craig. Yeah. Just Google about. Or plainenglishfinance.com, plainenglishfinance.co.uk. They both work. And we're actually quite, we launched a YouTube channel 10 months ago. We've got 6,100 followers, which I think is quite good. That's great. Excellent. Excellent. Not bad for 10 months. Um, And I'm really proud. We're doing 10, 12, 15 minute videos. And it's basically a free course in effective financial literacy, which I'm really proud of and work really hard. Big up so. YouTube, educating the world, man, for it. free. But there's so know. much crap on YouTube. We're but trying to be. But there's so much good stuff. You've like got to anything, there's, around, there's like shit music, there's pig. good music. Yeah, exactly. You know, it just depends. What do you want to do? Eat shit, talk shit, or do you want to actually learn something and do something? And of course, my books are available on Amazon. <laughs> So there you have it. That was this week's episode of Business Without Bullshit. Thank you, Angie. Thank you, Dee. Uh, Thank you, Simran. Thank you, Romeo. Until then, it's ciao.